Hey everybody, I hope that you are having a great week to this point. Uh, this is going to be a little different uh, than we normally do it here on the Black Voice channel. Uh, this is going to be an explore, exploration of work that uh, my brother 19 Keys and brother... Uh, KT, the arch degree, um, their decoding of They Clone Tyrone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore elements of this decoding process. And I'm going to do it over a series of sessions. Uh, and the reason I do it is, man, I love brothers who think. I love brothers who challenge the status quo of ideas. I love brothers who are able to explore things outside of the common narrative, outside of the matrix, so to speak, and to really truly ask questions. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of initially lay down the foundation of my process of discovery and then go off into what they're saying in a particular area. We're gonna start with Brother Fontaine, Mr. Fontaine, the focus of this particular movie uh, they cl clone Tyrone. We're going to talk about cloning as a uh, theme, as a philosophy, as a process. And I really want you to think for a second. I want you to get outside of the scope and idea of what cloning is because I'm going to take you to a place that's a little bit more ah. Uh, uh, and I want you to really truly think about what I'm saying. Uh, but what I want to do is, first of all, I. I absolutely love when I can see a, a brother or a sister, but definitely a brother, be able to use his brain. I'm going to explain something to you about intelligence. I'm going to explain something to you uh, about um, the power of the mind, the power of the brain, intelligence, and how smart you are and all of that. Let me tell you something. The capacity or the measurement of one's intelligence isn't how much information they can regurgitate uh, from books, from courses, from classes. Uh, it's good. You need to be an avid reader. You need to consume. One of, the, one of the most powerful elements and components of reading is you get to control what enters your gate. Uh, as well as what you watch on YouTube, what you watch on television, what you listen to in music, what you listen to in audio uh, content is one of the most powerful ways to manage your con uh to manage your gates and guard your gates your gates are what programs your subconscious your subconscious literally controls 96 percent of your behavior so it's not what you can consciously manage your conscious is what sets the standard or the focus on what is important to you your conscious is what prioritizes uh, what matters to you so that your subconscious can focus on it. That's why uh, you shouldn't focus on the things you don't want. You shouldn't focus on the idea of lack. You shouldn't focus on the idea of powerlessness. You shouldn't focus on the idea of poverty. You focus on what you want and you focus on it with a confidence that your mind can produce it because because it can. Everything that you're looking at, every situation, every it started with a thought. It started with a thought that emerged from a belief and then executed itself. And that's the thing that I want you to try to get and understand. But the intellect, the intellect is only as potent as its capacity to solve your problems. True intellect, true intelligence is only seen in the manner in which it can resolve the enigmatic issues that you face. And so when we talk about, when we talk about this, I want you to sort of look at it from a place of discovery because everything to me is about discovery. Everything to me is about becoming aware of something for the purpose of it producing something better so when i'm looking at something i said okay this is what's happening to us but i want to know how it happened why it happened and who did it so that i can come up with a solution and also be prepared for the countermeasure be pre prepared for the next thing and i'm going to talk to you about that so there is a trichotomy of discovery for me it is who why and how 
Okay, I need to know who it is so I can identify the source. Uh, the source. I need to know how so I can identify the origin. I need to know why so that I can be prepared for the counter move. And this is how this works. Most people observe things on the surface. Most people sit up and they only th see things as it's happening. And so you get a superficial novel idea of what's happening very rarely even looking for a solution simply looking to complain point fingers and expecting someone else to resolve the issue for you when you sit up and you are looking for the you're using a trichotomy or whatever uh, element or component or dynamic you use or or equation or whatever you want to call it to discover something it has to be for the purpose of solution i say i need to know who because that identifies the source but then the how tells me where it started the origin and if I understand the origin I can address it at the origin that's how you heal anything that you're dealing with with life if you want to address it you don't address it at the symptom you address it at the source if I want to change something I don't change it at the symptom I can mask the symptom I can suppress the symptom but the illness still persists and that's illness, whether you're talking about biological, whether you're talking about mental, whether you're talking about social, whether you're talking about economics, it's all the same. It's an illness. It's a broken element or component of life, and it has an origin. I find it. I deal with it at the source. There's the solution. There's always a solution. There's nothing in this universe that presents itself as a problem that does not have the opposite and equal force or reality which is the solution and your job is to find it but you cannot find it standing on the surface you have to look beneath and so when I do this I took the route of developing an understanding of scientific method you know going through the processes but let me explain something but you never hear me ranting and raving about my degrees why I got those for me actually I was recruited to get the first one the first doctorate uh, but the degrees were just me doing stuff because it was and honestly because I could um, but my my point of discovery doesn't require a degree. It requires the ability to escape and think. Nothing wrong with having degrees, but you got to be able to think, and anybody can do it. But you got to get outside of the box. You got to be willing to escape the narrative. And the, what I love about both of these brothers is they do it with ease. They do it with ease. They're not they're not shackled to an idea. They're not shackled to a notion. And one of the problems with anybody that says I do, I did my research is number one, they're not aware of um, confirmation bias, uh, which is you tend to look for the things that are going to produce the answers. And in a world where you're typing in keywords, your keywords are going to determine what you find. You're going to type in keywords that, you know, what is this or show me this well it's going to show you that because that's absolutely nothing you can come up with to think about that somebody hasn't put on the internet doesn't mean it's true doesn't mean it's accurate doesn't mean it's uh, completely fleshed out it just means that that's how that person thinks and that's what that person does and nobody is governing what is being put on the internet so then you have to actually have mechanisms that ensure that you are uh functioning in your bias so what i do is I work from the outside in. What does that mean? I normally come up with an idea of something and then I try to prove myself wrong first. What that does is it guarantees that I'm going to look at all of the opposing evidence before I start compiling the evidence that supports what it is that I am attempting to accomplish. And so then I bring it all together and I use it and I explore and I explore and I look beyond that. I am in preference when we're talking about scientific method. I am more uh, in aligned with qualitative data, even though it doesn't have the quantitative easy measurements. Quantitative data are numbers. You measure this. There, are this many percentage of people doing this. This they did this. They took this at this dosage. They did, and it's quantitative, so you measure it. You get the numbers, and you can get all that. Qualitative is more about people moving it is a more accurate representation of movement in life the xyz doesn't take in the factors the one excuse me the one two three doesn't take in the factors of the xyz the xyz says all this stuff is happening and then you get to explore the different explanations of why it happens in real time and when you can merge the two you can really truly get a great understanding and i think these guys are exceptional at doing this what i'm going to talk about here is just our man mr fontaine in this thing the first thing that these guys talk about is what's obvious is that you get all the way to the end of the movie and you realize that 
the person you think is being cloned is a clone and then it's not tyrone the guy's name is tyrone nobody in the freaking movie's name is tyrone but tyrone himself is a clone the the very name of tyrone is a clone when you think of tyrone what do you think of first and foremost if you're part of our culture erica badu called tyrone there is you know this quote unquote certain uh hood element associated with tyrone certain you know this that it's archetypical stereotypical stereotypical of the black male tyrone leroy you know what i'm saying and so there's this guy so what and, and it points to the biggest idea that these guys bring out in the early early parts of their discussion is they only clone the things that produce negative results they clone the thug they clone the dope dealer they clone the pimp they clone the prostitute they clone the hustler they don't they don't clone the great thinker they don't clone the inventor they don't clone the radical unapologetic you you're not gonna get them cloning dr Khaled muhammad but they will try to overly produce and clone the earlier version of dr king and they will sanitize and, and pull out on a scientific level everything that is in diametric opposition to this very very docile let us all get along person who this wasn't who dr king was towards the end this wasn't who the united states government was found guilty in 1999 of being complicit in this death that's not the king you're getting that's not the king they cloned. And what you got out of that cloning was a bunch of eloquent speakers, a bunch of people who could draw a crowd, but did not have the backbone or the heart to, to move. See, they didn't clone Fred Hampton. He scared the hell out of them. They didn't, they didn't clone him. They killed him. And so when we talk about cloning, I want to redefine it. Uh, some people think of cloning in this movie as a metaphor. Because it starts out, okay, what's really going on? You're trying to figure out what's going on. And so did they really truly genetically clone him? And the idea of cloning is what you got to understand is let's go back and let's look at life. Let's look at it from a biological, biological molecular or genetic level. The human body has been cloning itself since time began through mitosis which is uh cellular reproduction one cell produces two other cells exactly the same as itself and then it dies and it does this or you can also look at the natural process of cloning in twins identical twins is the cell is the over splitting and creating two identical things coming from the same ovum, which, which 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 came through a split it's it, it's a form of cloning one cell cloned itself and became two and both both were uh uh, both were fertilized and became uh, and they became twins uh, but what they also point out is and this aligns with my uh, findings and teachings and lectures on epigenetics environmental influences on genetics they talk about even when you clone something that the clone no matter how many times you clone it you don't get the same clone each clone in itself is a version of the original but not the same why because when you clone something it is still subjected to the environment. Now, I've talked about that in epigenetics. One of the first studies in epigenetics was studying identical twins and how over time they become they became more and more uh, distinct and discernible and in health outcomes and life outcomes and everything else based off of what environment environments influence genetics but our environment influences everything else around us. So then even when there is this cloning process you get something different based off of the environment and I've been talking about this for how long how long have I been telling you that one of the things that we have to focus on is environment why environment is going to dictate our health more than our diet in ep epigenetics I tell you about this epigenetics is one the uh, explanation of how we pass down multi-generational trauma uh, genetically there are epigenetic tasks for every traumatic experience the body experiences it in the body matter of fact before you ever experience it psychologically or emotionally your body experiences your body is the first receptor or perceptor of threat 
That's why the hair on your neck stands up when something's about to happen before you even process it in your mind that it's happening is that the body is instinctively and uniquely and ingeniously designed to uh, detect a uh, threat and to prepare you to respond to the threat. But what happens is when you experience it, every cell in the body records it and every cell in the body has its own hard drive. So every cell in the body is able to uh, literally record a memory. So when you have someone who is triggered through traumatic memory or what we call implicit memory, what is happening? It's they are literally reliving an event that's already happened that traumatized them. They're not mem remembering it. They're reliving it. The smell, the taste, the feeling of fear, anxiety, hopelessness. All of these things are going on and you're wondering why they're not they're not uh, behaving a certain way or why they're simply going left and they're not listening to reason or why they're acting so out of character. It's because they are back in a place that impacted them in such a way that it literally imprinted itself upon their genetic makeup. Now, what has happened? Why is it so hard for them to realize that it's just in the past? Well, first of all, what traumatic, uh, traumatic uh, injury is, is an event that's so catastrophic in perception, physiologically, emotionally, and psychologically, that it literally refuses to log itself in linear, uh, in your linear timeline. Your linear, linear timeline, when simplified, is what? Past, present, future. So when something happens, no matter how bad or good it is, normally, the moment that it happens, every day after that, the impact on you is less. Why? Because it's in the past. When you experience trauma at a level that it traumatized, now people experience trauma and aren't automatically traumatized, but there's a lot that goes into that too much to get into today. But what happens is when a person experiences trauma, that emphasis or that emphatic imprint that happens actually happens in a way that it does not process. It isn't logged as a linear event it's real so what happens that remains a threat it's not in the past it's a current threat that rises at the trigger and the trigger can be a color the trigger can be a smell the trigger can be uh, any of a number of things and a lot of times people don't even know their triggers they a lot of times people don't even know they're being triggered now all of this is playing into all of this different stuff just in different ways and at, at, hopefully by the time I finish the series it'll all make sense but you, I, I really want to focus on this whole idea of cloning because cloning isn't just the genetic part it's the convincing of a people to reproduce a certain type of person and that is done through propaganda. It's done through messaging in other areas, but it is a consistent message of what is. It is a consistent message of what you should chase. And the thing is, all of the things that you can see is what? Negative. All of your, and they point to this, all of the favorite T shows, the hot TV shows are with black men in stereotypical or archetypical black male behavior. Um, power uh, even back in the day what's the one that used to drive me absolutely in the empire snowfall um, what's another one black mafia family and there is a level of looking at this and getting nostalgia and connecting with it and the thing is if you came from the hood you relate to it but at the same time there has to be an understanding of what this type of behavior produces for the person who is perpetuating it and for the people around them and for the lives that they negatively impact through what they're doing in their communities and you have to understand that outcome can't be the outcome for our people but what you don't understand is they didn't just clone the idea or the mind or the behavior they clone the drive the drive is, this is what you wanted, this is how you get it. The drive is the notion and the idea. In other words, they clone the mindset. The mindset is the only way out of the hood is. So then when you look at it, you start to understand it from a perspective of, it's not just can they genetically clone you. 
you know how many times will it take to take that and so what happens is when people hear cloning the first thing they think about is I'm not giving my DNA to Ancestry.com. I'm not giving my DNA to one, two, three, or whatever that other stuff is that that that, that they do and they go research. Ancestry. I'm not giving that. They, they're not going to clone me. That isn't the clone you need to fear. The clone you need to fear is the behavior being observed in you. And if the question then becomes to me, if I were to be cloned, and the predominance of my nature is cloned and reproduced do i provide a positive and a plus to the community or am i a detriment to the community could two of me be better for the community or worse three four five of me whatever and so basically what you're doing is you're reproducing clones now uh it's happening genetically even when you produce a child that isn't a twin you produce a child it's a part clone of you and your space 23 chromosomes from the male 23 chromosomes from the female and you come together with 46 chromosomes that produces another person now in that is the cloning of two different individuals that will be genetic contributions from both sides that uh from the eye color the hair color but also to the uh psychological disposition the proclivity towards uh trauma the, the proclivity towards violence all of these different things are going to be passed down things that are part of the genetic makeup what you have to understand is violence isn't just a mental or emotional thing it's a program thing it's in your genes and so the more that you experience violence the more it's programmed i told you the proclivity from violence comes from uh desensitization based off of being a victim of violence are witnessing violence it's coming off of urban hassle the irritability that will normally especially in men irritability or urban hassle the things that make you edgy having to navigate through gang violence having to navigate through drug violence having to uh, deal with sirens and gunfire all times of the night uh, having to deal with the fear of what it feels like when a police officer gets behind you or approaches you all of these different things is called urban hassle and it makes you more edgy and agitated and more likely to uh, be prone to violence then you have the lack of proper racial socialization what is that the preparation and the awareness of who you are what you are why you're here your responsibility to be pro-social in your environment meaning that you are literally here and designed to do something to advance not just yourself but your family not just your family but your community not just your community but your race but you have to be aware of it what because why the moment that you step outside of the confines of the social structure of your home you move into an environment that is inherently hostile towards you you move into an environment that by its very focus and and, and, and construct is designed to redefine you your mother tells you you're smart your father tells you you're capable and then you step out into this community and it tells you that you're a thug. It tells you that you're naturally violent. It tells you that you are hypersexual. It tells you that you have no self-control. It tells you that you are more likely to go to prison than you are to college. Why? And then you and, and, and if you're not properly socialized, you become a victim of what's being pushed. There is an understanding of how propaganda propaganda operates. Hitler just didn't go off into Germany from Austria and say hey man look I'm taking power I'm gonna do this thing I'm, 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 I'm about to jack these cats up I'm tired of them he went in and he used a propaganda tool actually discovered from propagandists in the United States and over time sent a message of how dangerous European Jews were to, to the future of Germany I mean a bunch of different things shared and over time desensitized a large part of the population and enraged another part of the population to the by the point that they started to exterminate European Jews people were okay with it imagine the t in, Hitler didn't have Facebook Twitter Instagram a thousand channels on television he didn't have any of that he had print media radio media and I believe television was just getting started 
and look at what they were able to do. Now imagine you're waking up every day and most of us are what using our devices, using devices to what babysit our children. We're using our devices because we have been put in a situation to where we are literally chasing this magic pill that's going to be the panacea uh, of everything we need. We get in the bag. And then chasing the bag, now you got both male and female out of the house. Who in the hell raising the kids? Oh, if they ain't at school, if people ask me, why are you dropping this kid off sick at school? I gotta go to work. I gotta pay the bills. Why? Chasing the bag. You're trying to prove that you're worthy by having the bag. You're trying to prove that you're worthy by materialism. You're trying to prove that you're worthy by all of the different things that they told you that matters in this world. And you've lost sight of the fact that the most powerful thing you can do, the most uh, explosive thing you can do outside of black love itself and to, and to procreate from that love is to encapsulate what you created through procreation and empower it. But when you're giving the kid the phone and they are surfing through this phone, everything they come up against is redefining them. Since um, 2012, there have been a number of different studies. I have been on the back end of a couple of them. And what I can tell you is, Instagram has proven to be one of the most devastating forces to young black girls. Girls in general, but young black girls from ages five to 13. Why? Because bullying used to be going to school and having it, dealing with bullying used to be going to school and having to dodge somebody for eight hours. Social media made it a 24 hour affair. Social media made it it made it possible for the bully to reach into your home after you get home and bring people you don't even know into your home to bully you too. Posting pictures of you, posting things about you. When, at a time when the mind is not capable of processing that, at a time when the, the mind is so driven on peer, peer acceptance that it becomes so overwhelmed. We are at a point now where black girls between Black girls ages 5 to 13 are leading in leading the statistical statistical category in suicide. You remember we used to say black people don't kill themselves? That's not the case anymore. There was a 49% spike in black male suicide ages 14 to 24 in the last 6 years. <laughs> Why? A lot of things happen when you are chasing something and then you get it because we've seen a lot of successful women kill themselves as of late as well. And, you know, a couple Miss USA, another beauty pageant person and somebody else jumping off of buildings. Why? Because they found that what they had been chasing didn't get rid of the emptiness. And the emptiness is there because they're not walking in the fullness of who they are. They are literally perpetuating the clone. Go play cute. Don't do anything of value. But the problem is there's a spiritual yearning inside the genetic makeup. The biological expression of who you are is simply an instrument of your spiritual true self. So then what does that mean? That means that I can be cute. I can get all of this stuff that they want. I can drive the whip. I can wear the red bottoms. I can get every pair of Jordans they have. And at the end of the day, I still feel empty. I went through this phase in my early 30s where I, I, I had did it. I had did all, everything I said I was going to do, I had did it. I, you know, I blew it up. And I'm walking through this huge house that I didn't need. I got cars I have to count. Literally, I can drive cars color coordinated with my clothes. And yet I'm waking up every morning, three o'clock in the morning, and I'm pacing and I can't go back to sleep and I don't know why. 
But luckily I had a spiritual mentor that I called and I said, something's got to give. I don't understand it. People are con constantly telling me, man, I wish I was you. I wish I had. And I got it all. And, and, and I feel I feel just empty. I mean, I can't even explain to you what was happening at that time. It was just that dark. And and what I realized was when after talking to my mentor was, you've gotten everything you ever said you want that was going to make you happy. And you still haven't filled that void in your soul. That thing that is deep within you, your very nature hasn't been satisfied because you were here for a reason. And see, the more you grab, see, when you don't have things, you're always focused on what you're supposed to have. And that's your focus. But for the purpose, for the person who gets all the stuff that they think they are supposed to have to be happy and then they find out they're happy, that's scary. Why? I got it and I'm still not happy. What is it going to take? And what I had to realize was, and a lot of people have heard me say this over and over again, is that the first half of my life was about me. But the second half of my life is about my legacy. What am I leaving behind? What am I producing that will outlive me, that will speak of me after I'm gone? And what I made up in my mind after that was, the past is about things. The future is about impact. And from that point on, every day I've woken up, no matter what's going on in my bank account, no matter what's going on in my relationships, no matter what, I wake up inspired, I wake up fulfilled, I wake up on fire because I'm walking in my purpose and I know who I am. The cars didn't define me. The house didn't define me. The clothes didn't define me. I'm who I am, whether I'm naked and desolate or pushing the Bentley, or pushing the McLaren, or pushing whatever, I'm, I'm me. And nobody can't take that from me. But what will happen is if I consistently consume the culture, and they talked about that. See, culture is this thing that you talk about the environment, right? It's the environment. It's the expression of an idea of, uh, of who... A particular group is in a particular environment with a particular environment but it's also the very thing you take from someone a genetic culture a cellular culture to start the genetic uh, cloning process so what what culture are you emerging yourself in what culture are you literally uh, cultivating with inside yourself if they were to take from your culture what would they be able to produce here's the thing and they talked about Pac. Pac being the basic archetype of rap. You know, everybody's pulling some version of Pac to reproduce. And they what they did is the power that be, the powers that control the distribution reasons, not the culture. And what we have to understand, we start talking about rap is not in totality hip hop. Rap is a skill set. Rap is a point of expression. Hip hop is a culture. It's everything from the language uh, to the passion to the purpose. It was the birthing of something different after uh, the uh, infiltration and disillusion of the Black Panther Party, the Black Nationalist Party. It was a new way of communicating. It was a new language. It was a, a, a radical expression. If you look at the groups in the early stages, you had some, you know, commercialized stuff, but this stuff was about power to the people. This was about educating the masses. The groups that got the most play were the groups that were radical and anti-system. And what happened is it evolved when the money came in, when it became commercialized and the money came in and the people started controlling the rap and rap got the banner of hip hop. When it's only a part and element and component of hip hop, rap got it. And so you hear hip hop and rap used synonymously. And so it sucked the life out of the true movement. And then on top of that, they took the worst parts of it and cloned it. And I'm going to show you where it's cloned now. Remember that even up until around 2005, 2007, probably ending with um, God, Kent, Drake, probably ending with Drake. That was this constant band of rappers starting way back with, with, with 
uh, Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel on down with, with Ron DMC, LL, Rakim, uh, Mos Def, all these people came. Everybody had a unique delivery. Everybody had their own style. Everybody had their own flow. You could tell by flow, by diction, by, I mean, every, you knew who it was within the first few words. Then after Drake, what? Everybody was what? Cloned. Same cadence, same sound. And, and, and it's like, damn, who is that? Who is that? Sound, sound, the same. Why? Because what they found is at this particular point, you reel them in with the beat. You reel them in with the beat. So then it got to a point where production transcended content. So you reel them in with the beat. And then you give them a voice that is proven, right, whatever. It's the same voice repeating what they want you to hear. It's the same voice. Molly's and Percocets. Bitches and hoes. Get the bag. Bang and pop, pull and shoot, wet and whatever else monikers they had for shooting your own people. And they put it on repeat. They didn't just clone a particular rapper. They cloned an entire concept and put it on repeat. And played it over and over again. And made everybody aspire to it. Made everybody dance to it. And what you don't understand is with rhythm, you move in alignment with the universe because everything is rhythmic. That's why black people experience things differently. Is because we are naturally rhythmic. We are more closer to the divine. And this isn't about arguing about stuff. No, come on here with this bull crap. But it's, I'm just telling you. I mean, there's always exceptions. But the average black baby has rhythm. I mean, look at it. And even when you can get a non-black and they have ability to count in rhythm. In other words, they're on beat. The movement and the flow of the body is not the same. There's a natural flow in system patterns, in, in biological structure, in spiritual expression but also in spiritual perception. While it leads to power, it also opens us up for manipulation. Why? Because they understand that if I can put it in something rhythmic, they will feel it. And then I can backdoor with a message that they're not even paying attention to. And why is that important? Well, you have to understand how you program the subconscious. Up until seven, up until age seven, up until age seven, most kids are on what you call uh, a brainwave of theta. They're downloading. Everything you say around them, they hear. You're going to hear repeat it, and, and they'll repeat you a lot because what they're doing, they're downloading. They're downloading what they can do. They're downloading what they can't do. They're downloading what you think about them. They're downloading what their peers are thinking about. They're downloading what is considered to be wrong. They're downloading what is considered to be right. They're downloading possibilities. That's why it's got to be, you got to be very careful of what you say around a kid. You got to be very careful of what you're speaking to your kid because you're their primary label giver. You're going to be the one who establishes who they are and how they see themselves because their self image, their self concept is going to be the very thing that determines their self esteem and their self-confidence and what they are willing to go after and do in this world. When you don't do it right, you open them up for uh, uh, outside suggestion. Okay, so then what you have is this, 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 this thing where we're creating this, 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 this space and this environment to where we're either sculpting our kids and building our kids and empowering our kids, or we're not. And then when we're not, we're leaving it up to someone else. We are the primary label givers. Uh, that's why I came up with my concept of vision ethics. Is you give a kid the ability to think and, and, and envision his future, the imagination. But the kid is in a state of theta up until seven. After seven, 
they're sort of kind of hardwired. They sit into what we call paradigms. Paradigms is basically the lens you view life through based off of your mindset, your makeup, your experiences, your upbringing. What's right, what's wrong. That's why you can get somebody that's from one background that sees somebody smack a kid and damn near falls out of chair, rolls on the ground, calls the police uh, and everything else. Uh, another parent sit up, sees a smack kid, say that's what they get. Keep them in line. Why? Paradigms. Paradigms based on background so then how do you get to a paradigm shift if your paradigm isn't producing from you you got to reprogram that subconscious but how you're not in you're not in a constant state of theta anymore you're primarily functioning from um oh, excuse me from a different wavelength uh based on your state of awareness and sleep sleep is delta then you woke your alpha and beta but uh how do you get to theta well theta is that state in which what you're not really paying attention or attention. Now, the subconscious is beautiful. Why? The conscious mind can only process what it's paying attention to. 2,000 bits of information per second is where it maxes out. The subconscious actually can process 4 billion bits of information per second. So the things that's going on in the background that you're not paying any attention to, your subconscious hears it, your subconscious sees it. That's why vision boards are so powerful. Why? You can put that vision board up there, and it's not just when you take time and stop and look at it. Every time you scan across it, your subconscious picks up on everything on it and reinforces how important it is moves it closer and closer to the top of your consciousness so that now everything you're doing is focused on what what you're building what you're doing what you're growing on but imagine when that same thing that's flowing in the mind that you're doing isn't the vision board it's the music you're listening to it's the videos you're watching it's the television shows you're watching and all of it is painting for you a picture that will produce the type of behavior that's non-conducive to the very thing that you say you want that's the way the game is being played. And what happens is they get the archetype of the most non-effective black and they put it on repeat. And what happens after time, whatever you see of yourself consistently is what you start to believe about yourself. It's powerful. And so then what do you have to counter it? That's why you guard and control your gates. What you want is to be cloned. See, everybody fears being cloned. No, what you want to be is cloned, but what you want to know is if I'm being cloned, that I'm, that I'm producing in myself the new me in, in, in whatever environment it may be immersed in, something resilient, something positive, something powerful, something uh, explosive, and capable and committed to doing what it should do to achieve the best version of itself and no matter what it's put into it immerses see that's the the nature of it it's like okay well what about if they just take that's the part that's why you're supposed to be working on being your being your best self so because the question is okay just like with pop they took the thug pop they took that part of pop and they they they, they mass uh, produce that the radical pop the pop talking about black power black love what the government is and all the other stuff he used to elaborate on in great detail they push that to the side if you're not really studying this dude if you're not really studying the history and looking at the industry and studying you wouldn't even know it exists so what happens well what happens is it's your responsibility to develop in yourself so much of who you're supposed to be that it's hard to extrapolate anything from you negative it doesn't mean that you're perfect it means that the very essence of who you are is to produce something positive that serves the people I'm not perfect. I make mistakes, but my intent is for my people. I'm not positive. I don't always make the best move, but my love and my passion is for my people. And in the love and passion for my people, even the energy coming from the mistake is positive. So what happens is when I produce something from me, it can't help but be positive. Now, it won't be exactly like me because it won't be exactly in the environment that I exist in. But what it's going to do is produce the best version of itself. And it'll look a lot like me. It'll behave a lot like me, but it'll be its own self. So then it becomes its own unique entity. Capable of being cloned or reproduced.
the thing that stands out in this, and that's what I really wanted to talk about, was environmental influence, which is I'm, which I'm going to sort of kind of translate, uh, transition into the next one. But what you have to understand is who are they cloning and why? They are cloning the darkness. They are cloning the destruction. They are cloning the helplessness. They are cloning the distrust in one another. And then they're putting it on repeat. And they're playing it over and over again. Look at y'all killing each other. Look, he killed his woman and his baby. Look, he sit up there and robbed this. Look, she sit up and did that. Look, she took him for this. And now he's this. And look, and you're getting it. And look, and, and then it's, look, you know, uh, Russell Wilson is a simp because future this. And all of it is a part of this process of producing this negative energy that has absolutely no capacity to produce anything of intrinsic value in the black community it is the crippling of the purpose of black people by mass producing the very worst of who we are and it's not through a genetic practice or a genetic mechanism it is through the repetition and power of the mind if you can manage and control your mind, you can control the world around you. The problem is far too many of us are being controlled by those who don't have our interest at heart. I'm going to get back off into this again. I don't have to tell you about either one of those cats. You probably already subscribed to their channels, but check them out if you're not. Uh, you know, I'm thankful to my client who I also consider to be a very good friend uh, spiritually. Uh, she's been a very powerful uplifter uh, over the things I've gone over, especially the last year or so. And uh, I thank her for, you know, bringing it to my attention. And so, man, I'm on this thing now. I'm spending time and I'm just going to like I'll go over one part just over and over again because I don't want the superficial. I want deep and I want to see what's what your deep is. And I want to see if it's something past that deep. I'm not in competition with anybody. I'm not out here. And I told her, I said, man, I would love to see uh, uh, ego, uh, egoless coming together of the minds within the community to address some of the things that are going on. And this whole decoding thing is not my thing. But when I get to talking about stuff like that, I can go. Uh, it's not normally how I approach things, but there needs to be decoders. And this, and, and this cat, man, uh, it's, and, and I don't say cat disrespectfully. This young brother, KT, the art um, uh, uh, degree. The arch of, I think it's the arch of degree. I don't want to be disrespectful, but this brother is invested. Same thing with 19 Keys, invested. He is a lover of great minds, which I can definitely appreciate. I love being around thinkers because thinkers are problem, problem solvers. Thinkers explore places and things that average people avoid. Because the truth of the matter, the average person is afraid that what they may discover might require them to take action. And it's easier simply to do what everybody else is doing. It's easier and it's simpler to just sit up and say, okay, this is what you want me to do. I'm, I'm in. I'm just going to do it. It's called, in, 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 in the science of psychology, it's called, uh, it's called, uh, wow. I got my mind on that Archer degree and I can't get it off, uh, but it's called default effect bias. And it is simply moving at default, the default setting of mediocrity, the default setting of uh, purposeless, or purposeless or meaningful movement, the default setting of just getting up and doing, default the setting of mediocrity. When there's greatness within, 
your genetic makeup there's greatness within your spiritual design there's greatness within your destiny and purpose but you have to be willing to stand up and explore beyond what you're being presented and be willing to scrutinize and examine mm -hmm. everything that comes to you so that you can move and operate and become the best version of yourselves on that note look i'm gonna get ready to get out of here i want to thank you guys for giving me your time uh, as you always know, if you believe in the work we do, support the work we do. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Yeah, yeah. They said I should give it up like that just ain't good enough. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be free.